Hello, Hello my, my name, name is Steve Mariotti, and I'm the founder of the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. I found it in a classroom in 1987 in the South Bronx in New York City, and the purpose and mission is to help people start businesses as a way to get out of poverty. This is particularly important today when we, just in America alone, have almost 50 million people that are defined as below the poverty line. With every single night in America, we have 550,000 people that are homeless. So this idea of entrepreneurship uh, being a partial solution to ending poverty, not only in this country, but also abroad, is very, very important. Along this mission, I've been fortunate enough to write 39 books and manuals, and these are two of the top-selling uh, books, and there are almost 20 million copies of these 39 different books in print in 19 different languages around the world. And we're very, very proud of that. Um, I want to tell you about my next project because I'm really, really excited about it, and I hope that it will be uh, the best project we ever do to help other human beings um, uh, get out of poverty and achieve the lives that they want to achieve. And this, this project is called The Triumph of the Entrepreneurial Spirit. And it's composed of 25 stories of people that have overcome great obstacles to become entrepreneurs and create successful lives in business and in their personal lives as well. And I realized while I was writing the book that I also wanted to have a documentary, a, a movie, if you would, but a, a, a movie uh, that is based on, on truth, an actual documentary of the lives of these 25 people, entrepreneurs. And we are well in the uh, middle of developing that, and we spent a year and a half finding the entrepreneurs and filming them, and we're really, really excited about it. Um, I think it could change the, the course of the debate on poverty and self-actualization, not only in this country, America, that I love very much, but also in every country, all 191 countries around the world. One thing I did notice during this search for 25 entrepreneurs who had overcome great obstacles to, to uh, become successful, and, and I call it the triumph of the entrepreneurial spirit, is there was a very high percentage of offshore Chinese, which I think is fascinating, and want to do a separate uh, uh, book and articles on that because I think that that is a really, really important thing to study and to understand. So uh, documentary should be done in a year and I hope everybody will come out and see it. It will be used in classrooms, not only in this country but abroad, and the book should come out at the same time. So again, look for Triumph of the Entrepreneurial Spirit. And tonight, I'm fortunate to have two friends uh, that are both in the book and going to be in the documentary. And they're both uh, local entrepreneurs here in Washington, D.C., the, the nation's capital, our nation's capital. And I want to um, uh, interview both of them uh, one at a time and then have a group discussion. So I want to begin with my dear friend Kathy Liu, who has a a business called Spa Logic in DuPont Circle, and I always get my nails done there, and my my hair and my facials. So, um, uh, your business means a lot to me. So, Kathy, tell us about your story. You originated in Vietnam with your mother, and just take it from there. And I'll interrupt whenever I think there should be a question. Yes, my name is Kathy Phuong Lu. Um, I came to America in 1995, and I went to come, became a nail technician, and I just always want to have my business. And right now, I own a spa logic in Washington, D.C., DuPont Circle, uh, for five years now. What did you go through when you first um, left Vietnam, and what was it like going to Hong Kong? I think you were four, uh, 13, right? Because you were in 
a refugee camp. Um, tell us about that for five years as a teenager. So when I came, got to a Hong Kong refugee camp, I was, I turned, uh, up, two weeks after I turned eight, uh, 13. So I have lived in a refugee camp uh, for five years in my teenage age. And was that painful, difficult? What were the, what's the, most people have never been to a refugee camp or don't have no experience with it. What, I, how would you describe it? I was lost a little bit at the beginning because after, it, everything happened so quickly. Uh, right after my sister dies, my father and my mom, my parents got divorced. And the last time I saw my dad was in, the, in 1990, summertime in 1990, and he came over to the store and give me a hug and give me the money and tell me I'm going to visit your grandfather in Huey's and I will be back. So right after that, um, I'm, I left. My mom took me and said, we're going to see your relative in Saigon. And that was it. And the next thing I knew was the next morning, I was at the train station in Saigon, going to Hanoi. And from Hanoi, we were in China. And from China, we took bus. It was a long journey. But at the time, I thought that was um, a vacation dream for me. Wow. Yes. Did anything really scary or unpleasant happen on that journey? It was a few things happened. It was really scary, but uh, God saved me for the, the few times I almost, you know, thought that I died. Because, um, first of all, we were waiting on the train with the strangers. Um, where there was a guy who came and to shake hands with my mom, and I, I didn't know what that happened. And I, I just got scared, but I just went with it. Do you know what I've been told? My mom and and then when we got to Hanoi, um, we were on the ferry. I almost got hit by a truck, but somehow I got out quickly. And then the car got back up. It's it's. Um, my head almost smacks, and that's the first uh, thing that I got scared. Wow. Yeah. What was the boat ride like from uh, to Hong Kong? Were you, you were, was it a ten-hour trip or a day trip? Uh, how? Tell us about that. It, it, it didn't end there. Um, it's, it's, uh, we had to train for into a different area, uh, and um, so after that we would we get on the jeep. And somebody t took us to the area where it's next to China border. Um, so I didn't know the name. I was too young to know. Uh, so when we ran, um, we got told by a leader to say that you have to go this direction. So we all ran. And then there was a guy who stopped us in the middle and had a gun. Scary. So it turned out that was, a, uh, you know, a, My time a in Vietnam, uh, my childhood, you know, my... Um, a policeman. My let's, parents were divorced. Let's and, watch uh, a, after a that, quick you know, clip. Mom, I was the only child then. My sister was sick. And my mom had a wholesale um, business store. And she gave the, 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 the product to the vendor. So every uh, evening, afternoon, I had to have my mom go collect the money from the vendors. And I learned the business from my mom. Wow, that's a uh, that's a clip from what hopefully will be a. They was a home armed with uh, a gun, and they check everybody, and everybody have to show them everything that you know, take out from their pockets, see what you're hiding. Um, in 1991, we had to transfer into a different camp, which is it's called uh, Tai Achau Island. Appreciate every little things. Be humble, be kind, and um, and never lose track of your dreams. And never let anyone tell you that you cannot do it. There's some caption that we need to uh, correct. Oh yeah, this is just our first yeah. draft. We've got another year to work it's on. It's a very long so story. Um, it's you know, a beautiful story. It's a but, story but, of victory. Like the story where we go, go, they keep going, going, and then we won the chip. And then there's a police stop us, then, that right there. So the police stopped two times. <laughs> once we were in Vietnam, and then once we were in China on the boat with the ticket. 
So, you know... Um, Unbelievable. Yeah. A miracle, really. A, a, I mean, I did well with it. I was 12 years old, being told to go, run, 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 do you know everything? And then when the next thing we know, I get on like a small boat, it's a kayak from China. And, you know, from Vietnam to China, it's, uh, the ball is very close. You can swim, too. But they are set up for it, so that's a guy who was waiting for us. So once we get in there and we get to the China, and then we safe. And then everybody said, just follow me, blah, blah, blah. We, go, we went with the, 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 the people, uh, what, what do you call that person? The group, the group, group leader. Mm -hmm. The group leader, the group leader. Mm -hmm. And they ran a hotel for us. We stayed there for a few, like 10 days at least, to wait to get everybody gathered together so we can get on the boats. And then we uh, escaped from China to Hong Kong. What a story. I mean, what, it's like a movie. And then you told me the other day about that you were one of the last uh, families to be allowed to leave the refugee camp to come to, uh, to America. And the other people in the refugee camp were set, set back home which um, just sent a shiver down my spine. What do you think happened to them? I wasn't the last person to get accepted, but also, you know, it's not everyone get luck, uh, have that luck to, to, to get accepted to come to America. Thanks to my stepfather, he was one um, that has, uh, how you say it? Military. Military. Oh, okay. uh, he was in the military. He was mm -hmm. in the military, so he has kept all his documents. Uh, that he approved that he was, he can't go back to Vietnam. And because of that, because you of were that, able to be relocated to D.C. Right. Because of him, that he and my mom married, and then I were underage at the time, so I was 17. And then once you were here, I read about how you started off making $4 an hour and being picked up as a group and then taken somewhere, and then you worked your way up. And you brought your A game to the Thank job. You, I love that section. Can you tell us about that? What like what life was like when you you're 18 till the time you opened Spa Logic? Yeah, when I came to his, um, everybody convinced me to go to school, and uh, I, you know I just went with it. And what I've been told, I said, okay, school, great. You know, I've been to I went to school in the refugee camp on and off. And I, I'm more like active. I don't like to sit in a boring class. I, I like to do things with hands and mm. all that kind of stuff and like talk to people. At first I was a bit shy and my mom always yelled at me, oh, you need to talk to people. Blah, blah, blah. So I, I did, I did uh, go to high school here in D.C. For, for two months. For the first two months it was great experience, sit in the class with everybody else. English was a little bit, I'm glad I learned English in Hong Kong, so I had a little basics. Mm. And I didn't know how I got in a, reward, a, a reward that I was the best student in the class. Wow. I had a gold medal. Do you remember medal. what high school it was? It's A+. Plus. It's Bell High School in Washington, D.C. They still exist. They still exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a high school teacher by trade, so I know right. that. That's it's, great. It's what happened exactly. after the two months? After two months, my mom uh, had my brother. Uh, my mm -hmm. mom was pregnant at the time when we first came to the U.S., uh, six months pregnant. So after that, my brother was born. My mom could not work, and uh, my stepfather had to support his four children and a family in Vietnam back then. Uh, so I'm by myself. I mean, I had no help, so I had to go work. So, so everybody said, oh yeah, just come to work. This company is a printing company. So there was a Vietnamese family that who are um, in the middleman, trying to get workers. But um, they cut the car, so we get paid only $4 an hour. And then wow. we have to pay for, uh, for our ride every day, $5 each person. And we switch in a van, you know, um, everyone can sit. We don't have a safe place. Like, individuals sit. God. And how far was it away? Like, was it an hour drive? or it's was it, it? Uh, it's about like uh, 45 minutes, but you know, mm -hmm. like they pick up people, they drop off, so it takes a little longer. So it's about like an hour and a half. And that went on for a year? Or? It went on, um, actually went on only for a few months. Mm -hmm. And at the time, my fa family was um, sharing a one-bedroom home with other family of four. They just arrived to, to America. Um, so one of her son, he was working at McDonald's. 
So one night he came home and he asked me, he said, hey, do you want to work at McDonald cashier? I said, but I don't know English. He said, it's not that hard. Everything is in the computer. You just click, click. And I said, okay, I take it. So I went there. I worked. Uh, I worked for one month at the cashier. Uh, actually, it's right on Ames Street, Ames and 22nd, not far from there, the restaurant. <laughs> That's what my second first job in the U.S. in within six months. Wow, and then what happened? I'm dying to... And then uh, after that, um, my mom said, you know, why don't you just, I think it's too late. I know you want to go to school, but too late. I mean, like, you're kind of 18 now, and you don't want to be sitting in high school for ninth grade. Why don't you go to nail school? I heard people do nail. I said, okay, mom, I go to nail school. So I get introduced by also a person who lives in the building and say, I know a friend that has a nail salon, so he can teach you, and I can take you to work. And then I also, you know, uh, he got me a job as the, uh, the uh, waitress at the Vietnamese restaurant. So I work there evening after nail class. And for years or? or? Uh, it took me for three years. I mean, actually only three months, I'm sorry. And then you got your nail? Three shift. months, I finished. I, w I applied for a job while I'm waiting to get my exam, uh, to get my license. Uh, so at the time I, I got a job also introduced by a friend that say this had a, this job opening in uh, Maryland, but it's very far away from DC. You might have to stay over so you can go home like once a week. So I said, okay, it's fine, I do it. So I did it and I was there for a whole month. I worked there for a whole month and then one day my friend called me and said, you have to go home. Your mom, she was rushed into the hospital because she has asthma. So that's why I, I came home and I never went back there. And then I found a job in D.C., so I stayed in D.C. and I worked in the area and near Chinatown at the time. It was two months. It was a busy place. And somehow I got, um, uh, someone introduced me to the owner, the other owner at the nail salons on U Street, 13 and U. At the time it wasn't a safe place, but I accept the job. And I worked with them for 18 months. As a, as a nail? As a nail a professional. Nail professional, yes. Huh. And was your mom all right? What, uh, did she recover from the asthma? Yes, she recovered. And oh. now she must better. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Oh, cool. It was tough. Meaning I'll that. say. I'm very emotional, so, you know, like, from the refugee camp at the church, teenager running around, playing with friends, all of a sudden all your friends left, and you kind of miss everything, and then you left, and then you came and you stopped everything, it's, you know, beginnings. It's a miracle. It really yeah. is. And then, so I'm, I'm dying to know the rest of the story. 18 months as a, uh, a nail specialist in the salon. Right. And then what happened from there? Each step is a step kind of of ambition, of moving up, so to speak. Yeah. That's well, what I love about it. Yeah, yes. I'm very ambitious when I was already young. Uh, when I was working there, um, while waiting for to get my um, professional license, uh, one of the co-workers, she, she's actually uh, older, just like a mother to me, and she said, I, I know this nail salon that are selling, but I, I want, um, I don't want to do it myself. Maybe I, I want you to come and join me. And I said, how much? She said, $40,000. And she said, we, you and I, we can partner with, but I was like 19. What do I know about my American business, you know? I took risks. So I said, okay, I, I go with you. And then she said, she took me, we drove over there, look at the play, and then she told me, I will be talking to the owner inside, see how, how the business is running, blah, 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 and you will be standing outside to see how the traffic. And I did it, but I'm glad I didn't go through, you know. I, I mean, it, I, the process I didn't go through. So I, and I just stay there still, working and professional. Uh, I love my boss, he's very nice. And then one day I have found this lady, her name Vanda. We still friend until now. Actually, I saw her two days ago. She came by Spalotic visit. She's very proud of me. And she was um, uh, 
shampoo assistant at Salon Charisma in DuPont, South DuPont Circle. And she, she loved my job. She loved how I did my job, very neat, very detailed. And then one day she came to me, she said, the salon where I work, they're looking for manicures. And you want to come with me? It's very good area. And at the time, I don't know where DuPont Circle is. Uh, and I told her, I said, okay, you give me the address. I will go there to meet the owner for the interview. And a lot of time I look back, I said, how did I do it at the time? My English so little, the owner would took it. And I came to interview, and they offered me $300, $350 for a week. At the time, I was making almost $500 a week, six days I work and long hours. Uh, so I told him, I said, but I'm making 500 now. You you lowering down my income 350. But he say, but this is area is very good, and this is the beauty like a um, full service salon. You the only person who do nails, so you don't have to share client with anybody. And I kept thinking about it, and I say, mm, you know what? Maybe you just give me a little bit more. How about seven hundred? 800 for two for two weeks because every two weeks payroll. 400 a week. Yeah, so 400 mm -hmm. a week. They say, no, we can't do that. So 750. I said, okay, I take it. And so I took the offer. After three months, I built up clientele. And I made more than 500 a week without tips. Wow, nice story. Nice story. And I also, not only to put any other um, Vietnamese or nail salon now, but I'm just, I feel like if I'm say in that environment, I would never learn anything better except just speak Vietnamese all the time. And I say, you know, here, there's nobody speak Vietnamese that I can learn English. Wow. So I learn English through uh, clients. How hard was that to learn English? Do you have to think about it? constantly and how do people learn English when they come here? Is it willpower? What is the... It was hard at the beginning because when I learned English in Hong Kong, first of all there was British accent and second the Vietnamese teacher teaches English so they have French accents. So when I came I understood I, I can write a lot because I was always writing in Hong Kong, writing my vocabulary, grammar, learning, because we didn't have anybody to practice in Hong Kong. And it was difficult, but I tried to manage. And if I don't understand the word, I ask them to uh, spell it for me. So then I can correct my uh, pronunciation. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. A beautiful, beautiful story. I'm sorry, I'm just shaking because it's kind of cold. Oh, are you cold? Yeah. Um, it's okay. I uh, don't want you to be cold. I have a jacket. Uh, is, that's my jacket. That's your jacket. Let me get that for you. Just enter it for you. So I'm shaking. I get cold very easy. I have a... Uh, Thank you. Oh, it's right. a live show. It's a live show. I know. Oh, okay. No, oh, that's all right. The audience yeah. will love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unscripted, the Mariotti yeah. show. Okay. All right. We have another uh, 10 minutes. So. Total? Yes. It's already 20 minutes past. Okay. So, what a story. God. Uh, God bless you. I mean, that is... Thank you. And I... I um, I love the uh, spa that you have, uh, Spa Logic. I, as you know, I go there often and uh, just find it very professional. And, and just every person that works there, I just find to be, you know, just reflects your values of determination and, and uh, hard work and kindness and humility. And uh, we're just all proud of you. Welcome to, welcome to the country. And Larry, I want to, First of all, I love your tie, <laughs> but I, it's been a joy meeting you. We've gotten to be friends. Me too. And your story just is, and after I'll that, show the, uh, all the refugee family would be sent, the information was sent to New York City at the time, they called the Refugee Center, so they can find sponsorship everywhere in the United States. Either the church, nonprofit organization, or even individual can sponsor that, so 
the first breath they chose. I missed the staff, I mean, so I came back in uh, 2000 and opened Miwa restaurant. Different, from different countries and ambassador from different countries. So we, uh, we are uh, lucky. And then after 10 years in the basement, I decided to move myself out. So I thought I don't get out of the restaurant business and do something else, but then I still miss it. I miss the customer, I miss the staff, I mean, they, so I came back in uh, 2000 and opened Miwa restaurant. Go to business in general, and especially restaurant. The three things that, that, that you need to know is work hard, work hard, and work hard. When I was first opened, I worked six and a half and seven days a week all the time and sometimes I have to take the shower at the gym in the building and then stay here at night, sleep on the sofa because it's no way to go home late at night and then come back the early morning so I stay here many days like that all the time. The second, uh, the second advice I would say is challenge yourself because you have to push yourself hard to, to, to do the thing what you want in this uh, business, what you, what your, what you go, what is the uh, market that you think you want. So uh, that's the second. And the third thing is running a restaurant, the cost. Control cost is the very important. If you don't control cost, your profit margin will be less and less every day. And it's the, you have to like people, because you deal with people every day, different, walk of life, people come from different places, and how you deal with people, and how you take care of the, in our business, we say so-called the high maintenance customer. <laughs> Regardless of what you do, you're never satisfied. But I love to do, I love to take care of these kind of people, because I always tell myself, if I can take care of the people that so-called high maintenance, everybody else so easy. So that's the, the challenge, you challenge yourself. Yeah, and uh, that's Wow, what footage. Nice. So, Larry, tell us about, um, and there you are with the president, uh, President Clinton, and uh, graduating from Tennessee State when you first came. Tell, tell us about that last day, uh, or the, the day that you left uh, uh, Vietnam and, and were on the boat for eight and a half days. Well, my name is Larry La, and I was born and grew up in a war zone in Vietnam. Uh, so we kind of got used to this kind of uh, strategy. But in 1975, called the Force of Saigon, that's April of 1975, we, the South was taken over by the North Vietnam, and the whole country is under communist. So at that time, a lot of people tried to get out of the Vietnam, but the, only the uh, people that in the military or the people that used to work for the U.S. government that got to get out at the time. So most of us, we just stayed there and lived under the communist country. And we decided to uh, plan to go to leave Vietnam by boat. Because at that time, we realized that it's very dangerous in the high seas. But that's a saying that we rather be dead than red. I mean, we can uh, be dead, but we don't want to live under the communist country at the time. So that's why we left Vietnam and risked our life. And on the boat that we have, uh, 292 people on that. And the boat is about 20 feet wide and 60 feet long. It's, it's two levels. All the young people was in the bottom, and the older people would be, and the children would be on the top. And so we sailed for eight days and nine nights there uh, in the high seas. Lucky that we our boat didn't run into any pirates uh, at the time because the pirates were very active in that area at the time because they know a lot of people left Vietnam with a lot of uh, available things so they wanted to rob that. So we were lucky to to uh, be safe and land in um, East Malaysia, Kuchin, Sarawak, on the Borneo Island, and that was 1978. And was that a refugee camp? There's a refugee camp in uh, in that uh, in that city, 
and uh, so we were lucky to be there because that is the smaller camp compared to a lot of other camps in the West uh, Malaysia. The population is less. We have um, probably about 1,500, 1,600 uh, the most. So in Kuching Sarawak, we just um, almost lie in jail because we cannot go out, we cannot do anything. And we are living in the camp that wire around us and we cannot leave because the police are around that. So because we are considered to be illegal immigrants at that time in Malaysia, so we were just there to wait for the UN High Commissioner for Refugee, UNHCR, come to interview, and then after that we have uh, people from uh, different countries to come to interview. So we're lucky to get uh, interviewed by the U.S. Embassy people then, and got accepted by the U.S. Immigration to come to um, this great country. This is the best in the world. And uh, at that time we were so lucky that we, uh, the, the refugee camp, there we don't know where where you're going and uh, until you get a sponsorship from the uh, the refugee center in New York they're looking for a sponsor everywhere in the country either a church or a nonprofit organization or even individual you can sponsor people so we got uh, sponsored by the first Baptist Church of Irwin Tennessee so we got there and that's a very small town in the valley and East Tennessee and um, you talking about culture shock, you can find better city than that. They have about 4,000, 5,000 population. Most of the people there, they never see a uh, foreigner. Or talking about Asian, they never see it. So it's a very, uh, but it turned out to be a very nice city that I was so lucky to be there. So I learned English from there, worked for a railroad as a laborer, as a office boy, and then I got an opportunity to go to East Tennessee State University. So I was working full time and went to school full time. And, and had already learned English? We what? learned some English in high school when we were in Vietnam, but the English that we had there is, could not use in that city. Mm -hmm. We could not understand them, they could not understand us. I, I think that's a different uh, kind of, but at least we can communicate by writing. We write some English, and so from then we we study. It's very tough to be in college at the time that uh, that without a good uh, profession of the English. So we we um, I always carry my tape recorder, and I always the last one to leave the class because I always stay there to to ask more questions from the teacher and then study my from the tape. So it's very. Uh, uh, Difficult to get through that, and uh, but uh, we work hard. We work hard, and uh, we overcome there. So I graduated four and a half, five years later, and I graduated with the, um, the with the um, cum laude. Wow, so nice job! The, with, yeah, with the uh, with the honor. And have you been back to? Uh, I went back to they Vietnam. Would be really pr no, I mean to. Oh, to Tennessee? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've been back uh, many times because uh, um, the I became, later on, they asked me to be on the board of the uh, the school, oh, the cool. alumni. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of the board members. And it's about to be four years rotation. But uh, last year I was there and I saw some new faces and I asked the um, <clears throat> director, I said, hey, when the time to me to, to rotate out? I said, no, no, you stay there. So they, they like me, so they, I stay there for a while, and I enjoy that too. So anytime I go back to Tennessee to visit my uh, school, I got to see my hometown, Irwin, Tennessee, and I still have a lot of folks, friends there. Nice. And then the rise to owning these two incredible uh, Chinese restaurants here in D.C., how did you, how, how did that happen? How did you get your start? And then did you always know you wanted to be an owner, entrepreneur? Or what was I think that we I was born in in, in the family of, of business so I think that we have some some business blood in, in, in mm -hmm. inside me so my father was a very successful businessman in Vietnam he was the uh, herbal Chinese herbal medicine he's a pharmacist hmm. so he's but very successful so I think I, I learned from him too and I get the blood from him too but then in 1988 there's an opportunity in uh, the our nation capital of Washington DC. The chef that want to open the restaurant called City Lights of China, he needs somebody to be in the dining room 
because he's an excellent chef, but he could not speak English. So, he's, um, so my brother-in-law happened to know him, so he introduced me to them. So I became a junior partner with them. So we uh, started the uh, business in 1988. But then it was in basement, but we have very good business. That's the time that we got to know the uh, President Clinton's people in the 1990s, early 1990s. Mm -hmm. So we were there. So we, we uh, so from there, I was there for 10 years, and I worked almost seven days a week at that time to, to build up that. And uh, so after 10 years, I feel like we need to get out of the basement. But my partner didn't want to move, because moving a restaurant is pretty expensive. So I decided to move myself out. So uh, I thought that I would be out of the restaurant business, but I still miss it. So we came back in 2000 to open the new restaurant called Miwa. And that was 18 years ago. And, uh, we and then were lucky. When, and when did you open And then Chevy three Chevy. years later, the owner, uh, the, uh, the uh, building owner in Cherry Chay Friendship Pies in, in Maryland, uh, come to see us in DC and want to offer us the space that they are building. Mm. So uh, we accept that and and we take a risk to go to the second floor because they have the two building wings. So I had experience in the basement on the ground floor and then now on the second floor. So we're lucky. Then it worked out very well. Friendship High in uh, Chevy Chase is a, a good place to be around. I had dinner there last week. It was wonderful. Yeah, so. thank you. But what stories, I salute you both, it's, uh, you know, you uh, often hear uh, about why people can't do things, and, and yet here you have examples, and, you know, there's thousands of examples of, of this around the world, of people who just refuse to say, give up, and they just, they, they just find a way to get it done. And it's extremely... Um, inspirational to me uh, you know I I hope other people will find these stories like that but it gives me courage I have issues that I have to confront and I I think of, of both of you and some other people that have just overcome things that I don't know if I would have been able to but, no, I, but I, we, we really admire you Steve after we learned actually I got to know you not too long ago but I heard about you for, for a while through the organization that you had but I didn't realize that one day I got to meet the pow the founder of the organization. Thank you. And it's a really entrepreneurship is really the backbone of small business, mm -hmm. and that give opportunity for a lot of people out of their poverty, or at least for the new immigrants that you know born and grew up in the war torn uh, countries like that, and to be in a new country like America to to realize the American dream and and work hard and be successful. It's, uh, it's tough, but entrepreneurship is the, the, the best way to, to, to lead you there. And I'm really very admired for what you started 40, you. 30 some 40 years ago, Very and you're still yeah. writing I, so I, many I, books to admire so many people, and, and that's a big deal. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And to close, the vision that I hope that will become a worldwide discussion and not just um, uh, here in America or one country, but that that the world make a commitment to ev to educating every child before they graduate from high school on the basic principles of starting a business. So, God forbid something goes wrong. There's uh, you know a tragedy. They have to move from the country to a new country. Uh, they lose their job. They have a boss that doesn't like them. There's an illness. There's a million. Uh, reasons why knowing how to start a small business is can be a lifesaver and certainly in both of your cases it's a, just a classic example so I'm really proud to be your friends I'm proud to oh, thank you. To, uh, to me once be. you make the commitment you stick with it don't back down easy don't give up yeah. and that doesn't mean you know mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you don't adjust your business like you're always open to change, right? right? Otherwise, markets can move right past exactly. you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I want to say good evening, and I hope to see you on the next Steve Mariotti interview show. Just like our business, we we modeling all the time. Yeah.
Did anybody have any ideas for a small business that you could start right now as a kid? Ariadne changed his way of teaching. And you can trade with anybody in the room. Now, he started talking about making money. And suddenly the kids oh, wow. were different. So when you hear people complaining. You see, you see those All students? Right, Bill Gates start off with zero. Rule for kids. It's not a color thing. You know, it's an opportunity thing. So greed has its benefits. But aren't we ignoring the downside?